I'm feeling a little less excited about this one than I did about our last episode. And I think that that has to do uh, with what I read this time. <clears throat> so I mean, if you listen to the last adjunct statements all about uh, the Silmarillion, uh, well, at least the first part of the Silmarillion, the Ainulindale, if you will. It was it was awesome. It was very happy. It was very cool. It was very like, oh man, the world's the universe is getting created, dude. What a cool time. Um, this week, um, I'm reading a book. I read a book. Finished it not too long ago. Um, that was lent to me by friend of the show, uh, Ed. Uh, so thank you, Ed. Um, reading this for the last week or two. Um, took me a while to get through. Still don't really understand <laughs> what I read. Um, but enough of the suspense. I read Alan Moore's Voice of the Fire. Um, which is pretty wild. Pretty wild stuff. Um, and I'm going to attempt to kind of explain why I wanted to talk about this um, <clears throat> in the context of a socialist podcast. Um, and like last time, I'll probably fail at doing that. Um, so Alan Moore, you know, you all probably know Alan Moore. He is the dude behind, <laughs> like, the best comics ever written. Um, like, all of them. Um, he, there isn't really someone like Alan Moore that stands out, I don't think, in many artistic fields like he does in comics. Um, he was a dude who kind of wasn't the first person to kind of take comics seriously and kind of try and make them something other than just, like, cowboys, but, like you know, like cowboys and Indians, but like in a comic book version, like I wasn't the first person to try and make them like a serious um, artistic statement, um, but he's certainly, uh, to my mind, the best, right? None of this is very controversial. Um, dude wrote uh, Watchmen, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, From Hell, V for Vendetta, Providence, which is relatively recently, which rocked. Um, he's written a ton of stuff, right? And if you haven't read the comics, you've definitely seen at least one of the movies that have been pretty shamelessly adapted from his stuff. Um, but this book is prose that I, uh, that I read. Voice of the Fire is his first prose book. I believe he's only written two. Um, I didn't know this until I was looking some stuff up for this show, but he's also done a bunch of poetry, which is interesting. Kind of crazy stuff. But anyway, Voice of the Fire. What is Voice of the Fire? Uh, I still don't really know. Like I said, I finished it... Um, probably about six hours ago, and I've been kind of trying to come to terms with it. It's a series of, I think, 12 stories. I'm not going to count them. I think it was 12. Um, all set in and around Northampton in England, which, from what I can glean, um, is just a very kind of run-of-the-mill city. Um, just north of London, seems like it's, I guess, kind of in the Midlands, whatever, I don't really know too much about it. A guy that I work with is from Northampton, and he was like, somebody wrote a book about Northampton, what? Um, but, they're like I said, they're all set in and around Northampton. They kind of connect, but not really. Kind of, they kind of do. Um, but they all take place in different eras, right? So the first story, let me flip to it, Hobbes Hogg is the name of it, it's in 4000 BC, right? And so the next 11 stories go all the way up to what was the present day when Moore wrote it. He wrote this 1995, I think. So it's this book is kind of like, like I said, all these stories are kind of connected. It's not like it has the same characters or anything like that. It's not like time travel. But it gets into Moore's ideas on like time and stuff and how we experience time and his ideas on myth and fiction and all this different stuff. Basically, each story has something in it that connects with all the other stories in some kind of weird way. Like they all they all kind of connect. Like, for example, um, and obviously there are going to be spoilers in this, but in the first story, Hobbs Hogg, which is kind of like the standout story, I think for me, um, and all of it, for obvious reasons, I think if you've read it, um, uh, at the end of it, when the boy is like <laughs> set on fire and like burning to death because he's being murdered as a sacrifice, um, he sees visions in the fire of uh, events that will happen in the future and events that happen um, in these other stories, right? Uh, this, that same exact thing happens to a bunch of other characters where they see visions in the fire of things that either have happened already or will happen. Um, and so that's kind of the way that they connect. This is also kind of like part cosmogony. It kind of is like 
Tolkien's, it's not, I guess it's not cosmogony, it's, it's like a study in myth, I guess. Um, so it kind of relates to Tolkien's work there. Um, part of this is also just like kind of how myths get formed. Um, I, I guess before we go any further, we should kind of talk a little bit about how time relates to this whole book. So it is written linearly to the, to, to the extent that each chapter takes place after um, for more forward in time than the story previous to it. But if you've read From Hell, you know that um, Alan Moore <laughs> has uh, studied a bit of this guy. I think his name was like Howard Hinton or something like that. Either Howard or James Hinton. Something Hinton. Look him up. Um, who was like a Victorian era uh, kind of like crackpot scientist who um, believed... He wrote, I think he was one of the first people to write about what he believed was like a fourth dimension, right? So he talked about uh, time and about dimensional kind of kooky stuff. I think he coined the term tesseract to kind of explain what a fourth uh, dimension might look like. But one of his main ideas was that when you are a human experiencing time linearly, that that isn't actually how time takes place. This, again, I don't really understand this, so I might just be kind of spouting some nonsense, but I think that what he was saying was that time exists, all time exists all at once, whether that's the present, the past, or the future. It's all exists, like I said, at once. Um, and if you were to kind of like zoom out, so to speak, to the fourth dimension, you would be able to see that the reason why we experience time uh, in a linear way is because you could kind of connect points on a third dimensional world using like a plane. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, his point is, is that when an event happens, uh, whether that be in the past or in the future, or whatever, it has like echoes, right? And so that's kind of like the main idea behind it, uh, Alan Moore's comic from hell, right? Is that um, the main character, Jack the Ripper, is like doing all these like bad things and he has these visions of things that either happened a long time ago or that happened in the future because when an event happens, it leaves like an echo in uh, time, so to speak. And so in this book, in Voice of the Fire, Moore kind of uses that idea to connect to myth, right? So as close as you can kind of get to like an original sin in this book, which is like kind of a study in humanity and then all of our history, um, you get the first story, Hobbs Hog, Hobbs Hog. So to kind of sum that up, what happens is uh, there's a little hunter-gatherer dude. Um, his mom dies and he's kind of like mentally impaired and he kind of doesn't really know how to like fend for himself and he's <laughs> kind of just like all around pretty useless, kind of a dummy. Um, so the hunter-gatherer tribe gets rid of him. They just go, you can't, sorry, your mom's not going to provide for you anymore. We don't want to have to deal with you. So they kick him out. Kid eventually uh, is like about to die, but he gets saved by this young girl and she takes him back to like her place because she's like a settled person and um the we find out that like she lives with this kind of like shaman-esque character right and the shaman eventually through a long crazy series of events we find out that like the little girl isn't a little girl at all and that she's <laughs> well i'm not gonna get into that that's well another story eventually the shaman winds up sacrificing the kind of mentally impaired boy um as kind of like the beginning of ushering in kind of like uh, a new age for humanity, which is kind of like getting past hunter-gatherer um, lifestyles, I guess you could say. So that act and all of the symbolic acts that kind of like take place in that story echo throughout the entire book, right? So we get this theme of like matriarchy being lost and like motherhood kind of like gone astray uh, by like kind of like a useless kid who's like helpless without its mother that like gets repeated throughout the book the sacrifice gets repeated throughout the book fire is like this destructive but also like all kind of like changing event or thing force i guess kind of uh comes back again and again in the book um but that theme of sacrifice i guess is the most important thing that comes back again and again and again um because I think one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about this in kind of like a socialist context is, first of all, obviously, because like Alan Moore is uh, about as far left as you can go. He's a pretty hardcore anarchist. Um, haven't really heard him talk too much about his anarchism beyond just kind of like run of the mill, like, yeah, dude, but like, what if like nobody told you what to do? That'd be pretty tight. Um, uh, comrade, nonetheless, I suppose. Um, uh, but anyway, what, what was I saying? It's, it's sacrifice. So... In a lot of these stories, we get dropped into the middle of a time period that is the, a transitional phase, right? 
Um, Moore wrote about how he wanted to write about the Jack the Ripper killings in From Hell because he thought that it was like this uh, event that ushered in the 20th century, right? 20th century? Yeah, 20th century. Um, same with a lot of these stories in Voice of the Fire. And in Hobbes Hogg, the story that's set in 4000 BC, we witness kind of the beginnings of humans settling down and not just settling down, but like actively um, trying to get away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle that we had lived for, I don't know, millions of years, right? Like a very long time. Um, and it gets ushered in by the boy sacrificed by this shamanistic character in a really bloody and violent way. Because one of the main points of the story is that the shaman thinks that he has to sacrifice this kid in order to like appease the gods for progress, right? That's a whole kind of like other facet of the story. Um, but in doing so, he he's told that the guy he supposedly is told that the gods like need him to sacrifice his own son and he's kind of like not about to do that he's like i don't really want to sacrifice my son i'm just gonna trick the gods and sacrifice this kind of like dumb idiot hunter gatherer kid um and they'll be fine with that so i think that i think that that's something that's actually really interesting in the book is that um humans supposedly if we take this as like you know alan moore's study in myth um felt that i get we're you know we felt that we could trick our gods that we had believed in for you know a very long time uh into giving us progress right and we do it in this really violent just horrible uh really like egotistical way where we want something and you know anytime there's progress i think this is one of the main themes of the of the book is anytime there's progress it has to be birthed in like a really violent uh, sacrificial way. Something has to be sacrificed. Um, it's the same thing in, I think it's the third story. It's called The Head of Diocletian. It takes place when, like, Northampton was uh, part of the Roman Empire. And the story there is it's this Roman detective kind of guy. It's kind of funny. It takes, like, the form of, like, very much just, like, a typical detective story, but it's, like, Roman times. I kind of thought this is one of the weaker stories in the whole thing, but it's, it's still, it's, it's a great concept. Um, there's a Roman detective who comes up to Northampton because he's heard that there's uh, rumors of forgery and the Empire is like, yo, we'll go figure out these like dumb British people who are like forging our coins. We can't have them doing that. He gets there. His like teeth are falling out because he's been like slowly poisoned by the water supply, which the Romans, you know, their plumbing was all made out of lead pipes. So they were killing anybody, who, <laughs> slowly killing anybody who drank the water. The guy gets there. His teeth are falling out and he eventually realizes that, uh, He's able to catch the people doing the counterfeiting because their coins are mistakenly too pure. Like, they're more pure than the Roman coins. And this is all kind of just supposed to symbolize, right, that, like, these people who thought that they were bringing um, civilization and culture uh, to, like, these barbarian British people, uh, syphilitic British people, if you will, um, uh, what they're really doing is creating a lie, right? A, this lie of progress, which is all violent. It's very violent. You know, empires, they, they don't grow peacefully. Um, and the character at the end of it realizes that he's been living a lie serving this empire that's, like, just going out there and doing bad things. So, again, that's kind of the same thing. It's kind of this idea of, like, progress as not only having to be birthed in a violent way, but it's Moore's way of saying that not all progress is good progress. Um, let me find this one bit of the book where I should say that the whole book culminates in the 12th. I want to say it's 12th. I don't know. Again, I'm not going to count. The final chapter is uh, as the uh, our postmodernist comrades. <laughs> That's kind, of, that's kind of a disgusting phrase. As our postmodernist comrades would call it, 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 it culminates in like this metafictive uh, uh, final chapter where Alan Moore is actually writing it and, you know, the story is about him writing it. And eventually he goes for a walk through Northampton, the actual character, Alan Moore, the author, and it's just him describing what he sees. Um, and it all culminates, if I can find this passage, it all culminates, here it is, uh, in, I think this line, this isn't like the final line or anything like that, but it's in the final chapter. 
And so this is just Alan Moore in 1995 wandering around his town after he gets done writing the book. He says, Here unmasked a process that distinguishes this place as incarnated in industrial times. The only constant features in the local interest photograph collections are mounds of bricks, the cranes against the sky. A peckish Saturn, fresh out of young, the town devours itself. Everything grand we had, we tore to bits. Our castles, our emporiums, our witches, and our glorious poets. Smash it up, set fire to it, and stick it in the fucking madhouse. Jesus Christ. So, a lot of those are references to stories that he wrote. Um, the one about the witches, it's pretty funny. It's like the story about like the last two like women to be burned alive as witches in England, which I guess supposedly happened in Northampton. I think that's kind of fake news, but I think Alan Moore actually knew that, which is kind of another wrinkle, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, he also, one of the stories he references there is uh, John Clare, uh, who's a famous poet, I guess. Um, who made his way through Northampton at one point, and even though he was like this genius poet, supposedly, um, he was kind of a little cuckoo, so they threw him in an insane asylum and he died there. So his point here is also that what we kind of collectively have considered progress throughout time isn't really progress, right? It's a lot of it is, uh, is us going backwards, I guess. Um, which, I mean, I, I, you know, Alan Moore isn't like a Luddite, right? Like, he's not saying, like, oh, man, like, everything used to be so good back before we had, like, penicillin or something. He's, he's I think he's making more of a comment on, on what we've chosen to um, prioritize in our values uh, collectively, right? And, I mean, you know, coming from the lens that Dan and I are doing the show, I think that I would probably say that um, we prioritize these things because <laughs> we are currently prioritizing what makes us money and we prioritize uh, things that we can sell as commodities. Everything that we can turn into commodities, we basically prioritize. And whether you have a hobby that you think is like, it, you know, it defines you. It's something fun that you like to do. Eventually it's going to get commodified and you're not going to believe it as a hobby anymore, right? Um, so I think partly that's what Moore is kind of critiquing here, right? I mean, he is someone who believes in kind of these shamanistic characters, these witches, as not being like real life, you know, witches and warlocks and magicians. And he doesn't actually believe in magic, despite kind of like all of those magically realistic -y tones throughout this entire book. Um, what he believes in, I guess, is the powers of our surroundings and our beliefs and our shared cultural values and our norms and the buildings that we surround ourselves with, the architecture, what we're told we can be, the symbols that surround us. He believes in basically the power of all of those things to affect your psyche, which affects what you do and what you say. So then what's the difference between uh, you getting, um, say, like, you know, some dumb idiot hunter-gatherer kid. I need to lighten up on Hob, but, you know, what are you going to do? Or not Hob, the, the boy. Um, what's the difference between him being affected by the symbols that he sees that the shaman writes on these stones um, and, you know, them actually giving him, like, a physically, like, a reaction where he's so scared that he has a physical reaction, right? What's the difference between that and now, say... Um, living in a big city, say in London or in Los Angeles, and you live close to the downtown of the city and you're constantly in the shadows of these enormous buildings, right? These are clearly the most important things happening. The most important things in your society are happening in these big, big, big buildings, right? And you're just in the shadow of them. Uh, and what's happening there? Money's being made, baby, we're trading things. What's the difference, what's the difference between those, those things, right? Well, I mean, I would say that the difference... Well, now it, and this kind of gets into another definition that is pretty central to this book and to, I guess, just kind of all of, <clears throat> all of Moore's work, um, which is his definition of magic, right? Which is, you know, when you go on Alan Moore's Wikipedia page or something, or you like read an article in like Time Magazine about Alan Moore and it says that he's a magician, like it doesn't mean <laughs> that he's like pulling bunnies out of hats or like sacrificing lambs or, you know, to like summon Cthulhu or something like that. How, how he defines magic is anything that's able to, any outside force that's able to change your mental composure and that's able to change 
how you think and what you do, right? So he gives the definition of the most powerful form of magic existing now is advertising, right? I mean, you know, you walk down the street and you see like a shredded dude drinking like an advertisement of like a shredded dude drinking a Michelob <laughs> or something like that. And you're like, damn, I wish I was shredded. I should drink some beer, baby. Um, that's Tamor, that's magic, right? And so it's the same thing with these shamanistic symbols on the stones 6,000 years ago, right? It isn't, that's magic, but not because it's like actually like, whoa, we're gonna summon the old gods, dude. It's gonna be wild. Uh, it's magic because it's changing how the character thinks and it's freaking him out because he goes, oh my God, magic's real, dude. Oh my God. And it's the same thing with skyscrapers or it's the same thing with advertisement, anything like that, right? It's changing the way that you think. Um, and I think once, you know, I don't know. I mean, once we understand that, um, I remember when I read From Hell for the first time, this is a pretty central theme there, and this idea definitely stuck with me. Because one of the ideas is, in that book is that there are these churches dotted throughout London, specifically one of them that were made, were built by this kind of weird dude, um, and he built these churches in a very odd way, a way that is like, you look at these churches, and I went to see one of them actually not too long ago in London, and you see this one specific church, the church which is like the epicenter around which all the Jack the Ripper murders happen. And there's something just so goddamn weird about it. It's really unsettling, just the architecture of this church, right? And I believe that like the steeple of the church is built ever slightly at an angle leaning towards you if you're looking at it from the front so that you're just, you feel like you're supposed to feel this weight of God, right? You're supposed to feel this weight of divinity of something bearing down on you. And to more, right, like, I mean, that's just magic, right? I mean, being able to uh, change how you feel and either instill fear or joy or happiness or anything like that, right? And I mean, I think that that definition of magic, which is kind of like a, you know, it's kind of a weird thing to say. It's not necessarily uh, pertinent to the Marxist project. Um, it's actually is actually something that's fairly interesting to consider, right? Because I mean, so many of these symbols that we see on Twitter by self-proclaimed communists, right? Dudes with like hammer and sickles in their bio or like, uh, you know, like, the Lenin cap wearing people or like the people with the red stars on their hat. These symbols have really come to mean something and they mean just as much as, um, you know, the skyscrapers or the, the scrollings of like an insane shaman uh, that were supposed to summon up these gods, right? They do the same thing. And I mean, it is something to certainly consider the power of symbols, right? When you're trying to institute any kind of, uh, social change. And I mean, obviously, this is something that people have considered. This is something that's kind of gone wrong many times because, you know, now modern society, you're just going to show anybody a hammer and sickle and they're just going to go, whoa, what is this dude? Some kind of Stalin guy or something? Wasn't that a guy in Russia? Didn't he like yeah, kill a bunch of Ukrainians or something like that? Um, I think that the power of symbols, the power of uh, mythology, the power of the historical process, um, all things to consider, all things to consider how these can all be used. Um, and I mean, certainly all uh, really important to um, Moore's work as a whole, but also to this book, because again, another one of the final themes that I'll talk about is how he views not only progress as something that can kind of be construed or misconstrued as a good thing or as a bad thing, um, how we define progress. You know, uh, Dan and I kind of talked about this in episode, I want to say... 11, where we talked about Hillary Putnam as someone who tried to redefine the philosophy of science as, you know, science isn't just working towards this ever greater truth. It's the same thing with progress, right? I mean, it's not like we're progressing towards the totality of all knowledge and all understanding of the world, and we're going to eventually be masters of everything, baby, just through uh, the power of the market. I mean, uh, the, the, that's all to say that the final thing I kind of want to bring up is Moore's uh, views on history, I guess, and on um, subjectivity. Um, this all kind of ties into the idea that the definition that he has of magic, it ties into his ideas on time, on fourth dimensional time, it ties into his ideas on progress. The reality that is real and the reality that we choose to kind of understand is the one that we, ex kind of exactly what I said, it's the one that we choose to believe, right? I bought up that story of the two witches who were the last people supposedly to be burned at the stake for witchcraft, um, and supposedly that happened in Northampton. 
Um, I did a little research on that, and that's actually turned out to not be true. What Moore was working at, and again, a lot of these characters, once you get past, like, you know, Roman times or whatever, are, like, historical, like, verifiable, real people. Um, and he just kind of creates stories around them, whether or not f with things that happened or with things that didn't happen. But these two witches, um, I believe this, their story came from a pamphlet that circulated England in around the 18th century, I think, um, that said that, you know, Two witches, Eleanor and Mary, have been burned at the stake in Northampton. Oh, pretty wild stuff. And that turned out to just be a complete forgery. Um, I guess whoever put it, it was maybe they're just trying to sell pamphlets. Maybe they're just kind of trying to spook some people up. But what's important about that is that Moore definitely knew that, right? He definitely knew that that story about the witches wasn't true. But then he decided to keep it in his book anyway as like this story of the final people to be burned for witchcraft in all of England, and it took place around this town of, of Northampton, right? And it's very strange. It's like, why would he include something that uh, clearly did not happen? And again, it just comes back to his ideas of subjectivity, which are in this book. Um, the reality which is real is the reality that we choose to believe, and it's kind of this idea of the separation between um, fiction and reality as being kind of porous, right? And as being um, one that can be manipulated um, really easily. Um, and it's one where things kind of pass back and forth, right? I mean, think of anything you were taught in history class. Think of um, stories about, you know, one thing we're all taught in American school is the story of George Washington, right, about chopping down his cherry tree, which uh, definitely didn't happen, but that kind of doesn't really matter uh, because everyone's told that it happened. And so in a sense, it did kind of happen, right? In a sense, these witches did get burned. In a sense, George Washington, for some reason, did chop down that cherry tree, which I don't think we ever really got a good explanation for why he decided to chop down that cherry tree. It seemed kind of like a dick move to me. I probably would have uh, not voted for him if... Uh, I was around back then, solely based on uh, that. So I don't know, why Why are we talking about this book? Well, half of it, it's just an excuse to talk about it because it's a pretty wild book and it's gonna take me a million years to figure out what happened in all of it. Um, partially because the language is so strange in some of these stories. In that first story, Hobbs Hogg, it's like you have to come to terms with uh, the narrator not having object permanence, the narrator not really speaking English very well, the narrator not really understanding what language is, but still trying to narrate a story in present tense without any kind of like understanding of how language works, which is pretty uh, hard to understand. Um, but uh, to me, that just makes it, it's just an insanely towering accomplishment. Um, but also, you know, it's just an excuse of Alan Moore. I'm kind of just using the excuse as Alan Moore just being an anarchist to talk about this on a socialist podcast. But um, it's funny, right? I mean, you, you can learn pretty much whatever you want to learn. <laughs> I know that's kind of like a stupid thing to say, but when it comes to reading nonfiction, as Dan and I do, um, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to understand and how you want to view the world, right? I mean, if Dan and I were doing like a Chicago Boys podcast and we wanted to uh, bend reality to fit the narrative that, uh, you know, what uh, uh, what uh, Milton Friedman uh, and the Chicago Boys uh, did in uh, to Chile was actually a very good thing because look at their look at look at their economy, the numbers, baby, they went through the roof. You could do that. You could pick any kind of nonfiction as uh, untrue as it might be. Uh, to kind of bend to your will, right? I mean, that's just the general idea behind science being a bit of more of a socially directed activity than we think it might be. But I think it's important every now and then to talk about fiction, right? Because Moore is able to do things in this book that you are not able to do in traditional nonfiction. Um, he's able to explore themes that you're not able to do because a lot of this stuff, like his ideas on the fourth dimensional nature of time, probably not true at all, probably a little crazy. Um, I'd probably be the first to admit that. Uh, but it leads to some kind of interesting consequences once you let your mind go places that traditional nonfiction would not let you go, right? Um, I am all that to say. You do some more reading. Reading's cool. Reading's fun. Or just, I don't know, watch a movie of it. Don't watch the movies of Alan Moore's stuff because they all kind of suck. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if there's there's a whole lot more to talk about in this book. Um, there's a story in here. Uh, there's a story in here called Angel Language that 
<laughs> I kind of understood. When it gets to the end, it's like this almost like Rosemary's Baby uh, hereditary-esque ending that just kind of blows your mind and you're just kind of like, wait a minute, what the hell was that about? Uh, Moore brings up all of these weird esoteric scholars in here that you know, whatever they're talking about, I don't understand it. It makes no sense. Angel language as being something that is like, like the language supposedly that this one crazy dude made up sitting in his hovel in England. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff in here to talk about and I've definitely not touched on really any or at least much of it at all. But all the more reason to pick up the book, um, find it somewhere, find it somewhere safe. Don't go to a bookstore, even if any of them are open. Um, get Ed to lend it to you. I'm sure he'd love to. Um, and let us know what you think about the concept of sacrifice as being necessary for progress. Because that's something that this book has got me thinking about a lot. Um, how and what are we going to have to sacrifice to get to the supposed promised socialist future? Uh, I can think of a couple, uh, things, perhaps, that could be sacrificed, perhaps our fetishization, and I don't mean that in a Marxist sense, although I kind of do, uh, mainly in, like, the weird sexual sense of, you know, uh, robber baron types. Um, that could be something that could be done away with. There's a whole lot of things that we could do away with. Um... But, yeah, like I said, this book is just very fresh in my mind, and I just kind of wanted to put something down to talk about it, because I am just kind of talking my way through understanding it, which I don't exactly understand yet. Might do another similarly an episode eventually, if for no other reason than that book rocks. Again, this book is a lot more... it's a lot darker, it's a lot more different, um, but still something to be checked out nonetheless. Hopefully, you will listen to Dan and I again on Friday, or you will not. I hope you will. But if you don't, uh, see you some other time. I don't know. Read this book. It's good. <laughs>